So are, are you an economist because you want to change the world, and make the world a better place? That's why I became an economist, in fact. Uh, I was an undergraduate student in history, and I only decided to do economics when I realized that economists have this wonderful position in the world, which is they can take the time to study problem deeply and come to conclusions, but when they are ready to say something, they can talk to policymakers. And I thought, wow, this is a great job. That's a what job we want to have. And so I did come to economics only when I realized that economics could change the world. Hello and welcome to Ways to Change the World. I'm Krishnan Giri Murthy, and this is the podcast in which we talk to extraordinary people about the big ideas in their lives and the events that have helped shape them. My guest today is a Nobel Prize winner. Can't often say that, but Esther Duflo, together with her partner, Abhijit Banerjee and colleague Michael Kramer won the Nobel Prize for Economics in 2019 um, for their work on poverty, really. But she's also with her partner, the author of a new book called Good Economics for Hard Times. Um, so we should start with what is good and bad economics, I guess. Because at the moment, economists have a very bad reputation in Britain. They are blamed routinely by our leading politicians for getting things wrong. So people in the highest positions of the land are going around basically giving economics a bad name. So what, what is bad economics, do you think? Yes, it's right. Economists are a very bad rep right now, and it's not just uh, from the highest level of the land. It's also everybody else, pretty much. Uh, there was a YouGov poll in the UK in 2017 that showed that the only people who are least trusted in economists are politicians. I think we share, we should take on a, a big part of the blame as a profession because bad economics is economics that's kind of driven by ideology and that ignores the fact. I mean, because, you know, economics and politics go together and all big political ideas have to be driven by some sort of economic ballast in the world we, we live in. And that's why I think people are so angry with economics at the moment, isn't it? Because things seem to have gone wrong. And uh, it's, it's also why we decided to write this book, because most of the issues that really animate the world today, people talk, you know, are worried about immigration, people are worried about trade, people are worried about climate change. Those are issues that have a lot of you know, economics in them. And economics is too important to be left just to economists. But on the other hand, economists have a few things to say, maybe some light to, to shed on these issues. And a lot of the best economics is a little bit silent. It's not very strident. It takes place in offices and it's more subtle and much less ideological than you might think. Because economics is often used by politicians to be proof. Exactly. You know, to be factual. Well, what is economics? What is economics? Economics is the study of uh, how people react to the economic environment around them, what makes them tick, or what is important to them. So it's very much a social science. It's a social science that kind of has its own approach, but is very much inspired by the other social sciences. The problem is that for a lot of the history of economics, it's been dominated by big idea and theory without as much maybe attention on the facts. And uh, some economists think that the theory is always better than a fact. And if the facts don't accord to the theory, then we should change the facts. And I think this has very much been changing over the last 20 years. But I think this change has not yet been communicated to uh, the broader public or to politicians. So are you an economist because you want to change the world? To make the world a better place. That's why I became an economist, in fact. Uh, I was an undergraduate student in history, and I only decided to do economics when I realized that economists have this wonderful position in the world, which is they can take the time to study problems deeply and come to conclusions, but when they are ready to say something, they can talk to policymakers. And I thought, wow, this is a great job. That's a what job we want to have. And so I did come to economics only when I realized that economics could change the world. And, and yet you're, you're, not, you're not a political economist, are you? You, know, you don't hang out with politicians and write their policies for them. What, why not? You know, is that something you intend to do if you've done this to change the world? 
Well, uh, I, in to, to some extent, I, I am actually involved in policy, maybe not at the level of, uh, you know, the, the talking head of parties, but very much at the level at which policy is being made every single day in the offices of civil servants and around uh, uh, the mayor's offices in cities and some such. This is where the real policies are happening. So how does that work? Just explain it. So a few, uh, um, about 15 years ago, we started uh, uh, with Abhijit Banerjee an, an organization called JPAL, or the Poverty Action Lab. And so with emphasis maybe on action, where the idea is that uh, when you have good insights, so first of all, we're working on evaluating what works and what doesn't work in the policies that help the poor. And doing that as rigorously as possible with the same rigor as you evaluate the effect of a drug. In fact, with the same methods. And then once you have a result, the reason why you created Poverty Action Lab is to talk to policymakers, to go and say, look, here is something you could do. And I think this is what you need to be as an economist. You don't need to, to be kind of in love with your own views. You need to be pragmatic and look for solutions. Do you think it is possible to solve the problem of human poverty? Not only it is possible, uh, but we have already made considerable progress in the last 30 years. So. In, in, in an international context where there are many reasons to get depressed about uh, the world, the fight against poverty since the 1990s is really a bright spot. And you can see it in the number of extremely poor people, which has been halved. You can see it in infant mortality, which has been halved as well. Maternal mortality, which has drastically reduced. The number of deaths from malaria, which have also uh, plummeted, even the death from HIV, the number of kids who go to school. So any of these indicators, you look at them and they are getting better. And I think that's a testimony to the fact that some countries grow fast, like China and India, but not only. Because even in countries that remain quite poor, uh, like um, take Malawi, for example, it remained quite poor, GDP didn't go up, the quality of the lives of the poor has nonetheless improved because of a policy focus on these issues of human welfare and because of a bigger willingness to listen to the evidence and be a bit pragmatic in the way they conduct policy. So, so that, I mean, there's a little phrase in your answer there that's really, really important, isn't it? Which is that even though GDP didn't go up. So you're saying you can solve poverty in a country without assuming that the answer is economic growth? So in extremely poor countries, it is very clear that economic growth uh, would lift people out of poverty. And the economic growth is desirable uh, in, in, in those countries. But it is kind of not always necessary and not always sufficient as soon as you move away from the desperation state in a way. Because take countries with very different GDP in rich countries, Norway and the US, have, sorry, very similar GDP, like Norway and the US, or uh, Sri Lanka and Guatemala to take poorer countries. Their human welfare outcomes are very different. The child mortality is much lower in Norway than what it is in the US. The child mortality in Sri Lanka is almost at the level of the US, despite the fact that it is much poorer economy. And it's much, 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 much better than what it is in Sri Lanka. So GDP is... is is not uh, the end, it's a means to an end. And in particular, when countries start, uh, when growth in countries slows for a reason or another, often it's outside a little bit of the control of the local politician because it's hard to know what kind of policies are going to change growth. But on the other hand, what is in the control of politicians is a focus on human welfare and they can usually do it is not so much increasing the resources, but in spending these resources better. So redistributing it? Not only redistributing it, even if you keep the budget constant, using the same budget in a better way. I suppose I should also say, when you, when you talk about GDP, are you talking about GDP per head? GDP per head, Because yeah. people might say, Norway and America, so how can they have the yeah, same no, GDP? No, no, yeah, head, GDP per, per head, head. Yes. Why don't countries just copy each other? So why, why don't poor countries with large populations just say, we will do what China did? And why doesn't it work that way? Uh, because uh, what, it is, what is it that China did? You know, there is not one China. What should you do to grow very fast? Should you start dirt poor and completely destroyed by cultural revolution and then put some amount of economic sense in it? 
Should you uh, embrace market uh, reforms? Should you have uh, industrial policy? You know, there is not one China. There is any number of things that China did, uh, which together contributed to what China is today. And it's impossible to isolate any element of the success of China and this, I'm going to copy that. In fact, in a sense, you keep wondering and economists keep arguing of that is, did China succeed because of the state ownership of banks or despite the state ownership of banks? Like, you would find economists arguing on both sides of this position. So it's not very productive for people to think, I'm going to do the same thing as China. What they could think is, I want to emulate China. I want to do as well as China. I want to have a population that is as well educated as China as an objective. That's great, you know. But they are going to find their own ways to get there. And the only way that they're going to find their own ways to get there is to experiment with policies and see what works, what doesn't work for them, and move from there. And that kind of pragmatic mindset is what will make them make progress, not just, you know, pining for the China America. So, so when you say it is possible to solve world poverty, I mean, do you think, what is the gap between the possibility and doing it? So first of all, again, we've already made progress, so that's a good thing. Uh, the Sustainable Development Goal call for the eradi eradication of global poverty in 2030. That's ambitious and that will to some extent depend on whether there is a global economic crisis or not, but it's not out of the realm of possibility. Um, so what stands in the way is just, you know, we could, I think we could learn even faster. Uh, there could be more, uh, more sharing of the knowledge across country, more experimentation, less policy uh, based on uh, intuition uh, formed in uh, capital and more based on the knowledge of reality in the ground. And then we would make even more progress. Because, I mean, I mean in, in this book, what, what, is, what do you mean by hard times? So the hard times are the times we are experiencing today, particularly in societies in the West, which are very much like uh, the Dickensian, you know, industrial revolution time, periods of disruption, where at some level there is, uh, um, you know, great changes that are happening in society, which turned us into the modern societies we are today for the in industrial revolution, but not without enormous amount of pains and suffering for the people who were sort of sacrificed on, on this altar. And to some extent, we are living similar moments where there is a lot of disruptions in people's economic lives uh, due to international trade, due to automation. Um, and we seem to have not really learned since Dickensian times the ways that we need to, we can and we ought to uh, help people dealing with this transition. We seem to be, just as in Dickensian time, we think to believe that if someone is hurt by an uh, economic shock, say they lose their job in an uh, industrial city in, uh, in the north of England, that's their problem if they don't pick up and move somewhere else. And that's just not true, because it is so difficult. These transitions are so painful, uh, both for economic reasons, for psychological reasons, and for sociological reasons, that uh, uh, people aren't, unable, aren't able to do them without help. And as in Victorian time, we consider that the poor were a priori suspicious of being lazy and they needed to be punished for needing help. Today, we are also very much operating under the same uh, model. That there will be victims, that, and that's just life. And not only that, but it's, uh, it's uh, kind of your fault if you don't pick up and go. That, okay, you lost your job, but there are other opportunities. You were doing, you know, you were making furniture somewhere. You can go sell furniture somewhere else. Uh, and if you're not doing it, somehow it's your own feeling. And I think people, um, it's just like a complete misunderstanding of, 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 of economics. Why? Just explain why. Because uh, it is not true that people, the, the economy is very sticky. Uh, people are stuck in place, uh, not because they are lazy or lack imagination, but because of material factor, for example, it's very difficult to move when your childcare depends on your extended family because there is no childcare provided by the state that you can rely on. When the housing cost in the city where the jobs are is so cr incredibly expensive. When you have a mortgage of your house and you're completely under it because the house's prices are collapsed where you are. So how are you gonna move? It is not 
easy. It is quite difficult, may maybe impossible. That's the first thing, purely economically difficult. The second thing is, I think e economists really, uh, what makes economics model tick often, and this idea that people would move and take advantage of opportunities is, is the idea that people are very sensitive to financial incentive, and that's what they're the most sensitive about, that, okay, if I see that I've lost my job, there is another one, I'm going to move, and I'm going to take advantage of it. But in fact, it's not like that, because there are many other things that people care about. They care about dignity. They want to derive a sense of purpose from their work. They want to, at their scale, they all want, we all want to change the world. That can be our local world. But So we, we derive meaning in our existence uh, from uh, a job well done, in a sense, and a job that is meaningful. That is true for me, that is true for you, that is true for the furniture maker. And when, suppose you've been doing this job for like 20 years and you've become foreman and the company goes away. What, even if you could have a job selling furniture as an entry level position or being the security guard in a furniture shop, that's not giving you back your dignity. That might give you back some way of earning a, a living, but it's not giving you back your status in life. And how can we not take into account the fact that it's a huge cost, it's a real cost. It's not in terms of money. It's in term of, but it's in term of what makes us human. And then related to that is uh, what people also deeply care about is their having friends and relationship and status in community. There is a huge epidemic of loneliness in Western societies, which is actually catching up even in middle income uh, country like India. People are incredibly lonely. And so again, go back, someone is well installed in their community making furniture and then the job goes and they are supposed to go all alone and start again from scratch. How is that not a huge cost? And economists have not paid enough attention to this huge cost. They think about, you know, people will adjust and at the margin, of course, they might not be just as well, but almost and life will go on. It has also percolated, I think, among politicians that that's mostly first order what's going to happen and we just need to pick up the slack of the and that was that that is wrong that is not a good understanding of how people behave i mean it's it's understandable though that these mis these um you know ideas take hold though isn't it because we live in a also in a world of 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 uh mobility and immigration and this is at the heart of the debate as well because people also see migrants coming to the country and doing precisely what you yes. said you know, we don't want to do, you know, which is to move and to start from scratch and to take the low paid yeah. job and, and build a new life. Some people do this. And in fact, also some people who lose their furniture job also do this, but it's actually a minority. Uh, what is very surprising about migration flows is not how high they are, it's how low they are, given the difference in the standard of living. Even if you take, for example, the European Union, where there is free mobility, anybody can go anywhere, even in the face of huge shocks like the Greek crisis, Greeks mostly stayed where they were. So some people do move, and these people tend to be super enterprising and, uh, and they take jobs that nobody wants to take. And it is not a surprise that as a result, a lot of the entrepreneurs, successful entrepreneurs, are migrants or children of migrants because they are they have been, you know, they're the type of people who choose to kind of pick up and make a living. But it is actually a minority of people. So we cannot count on everybody to have this entrepreneurial spirit in them. Some do, some don't. So, you know, we have to make a, a society that works for the majority of people, not the, 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 the extremely motivated ones. But what, one of the ideas that you've taken on in this book is the idea that immigrants lower wages, uh, which is one that you know, the Labour Party argues and says, yes. you know, there are, you know, there are, there are downsides to migration and, you know, you've got to make sure that the labour market isn't, um, you know, uh, isn't deflated and, and, and we need to, we need political intervention to stop this. You're saying that doesn't happen. Yes, so actually uh, all, all the research or the vast majority of the research, and there has been study after study after study of migration. There was a report from the National Academy of Science in the US that summarised maybe hundreds of studies. And they all come to the conclusion that the effect of uh, low-skilled migration on low-skilled wages is zero. So in other words, when you Zero. Have, it's not just that it's small, it's zero. It's zero. And 
you have even when you have big waves of migrants, for example, when Cubans came to uh, Miami in big wave, uh, when uh, Castro gave them the green light for a short period of time, you had a huge wave of Cuban migrants. And David Card, um, a labor economist at Berkeley, studied this episode and looks what happens to the wage of the low skill people in uh, Miami compared to any other similar cities? Nothing. Opposite, in the, in, in the 1960s, uh, there was already uh, um, a lot of protest against migrants, etc. And so there was, a, finally, Kennedy decided to send back home all of the temporary migrants that were working on farms in California. What happened to wages? Nothing. So we we discuss this evidence in, in the book, and we do realize that it kind of goes against the grain because you're thinking very simply, more people, lower wages, that makes sense. So we also go the next step and say, well, why is that basic economic logic failing? And uh, there are many reasons for that. One is that when migrants come in, they have to eat, <laughs> they consume, and uh, actually the demand for low-skill labor also goes up. So that helps. So that counteracts any negative effect. The other is that Migrants do not directly compete for native uh, because the native workers are already scanded in their relationship. Most labor market relationships are very much ones of networks and of uh, trust, etc. And the low skilled migrants have access to none of that. So they are not really competing in the same market. The only thing they can do is take the job that nobody wants. And so by taking the job that nobody wants, they suddenly make some services available for cheaper that were available before. So that actually frees up some native worker to work. For example, you now have gardeners and people who pick up your trash, and you have uh, um, uh, much cheaper uh, restaurants and things like that. So the high skill women who were before had to stay home uh, to take care of their kids and their family can go to work. And when they go to work, they hire people. And that also contributes to create employment for, for the native workers. Also, what happened in the case of the, the farmers in, uh, in California is that when the migrant got sent home, the farmers mechanized. They didn't replace the migrant by a native worker because they knew the native worker wouldn't take the job. They just mechanized. So again, another reason why migrants do. So we try to go through this to say, don't just take a word for it. First of all, this is what the evidence shows across a variety of contexts. And second of all, these are the reasons why you have no reason to, to fear low-skilled migration. And it's not, therefore, uh, really a moral argument. It's not, I should be uh, for migration because I'm a good person, despite the fact that it's going to hurt us. It should be, look, the economic impact is going to be rather small. But th this is a very well-rehearsed argument in this country now. And, 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 and when people hear that argument, they often say, ah, but what about the impact on services, on school places, on you know, how easy it is to get a, an appointment in my hospital or doctor's clinic. You have to factor that in as well. And you also have to factor in, I suppose, by your own argument, how people feel yes. about migrants. Absolutely. So on the, on the former, so that's another issue, which is do, do migrants cause congestions in the, in, the, in the social services? But that's something which is much more solvable, it seems to me, because we could... Uh, we could in principle, increase the budget of these services uh, so that there is no congestion, and it would have the added benefit that it would create jobs. For native worker mostly, because it's not the migrants that are going to teach the extra kids, it's people who already have uh, an education. So, so this could be solved by policy, and it would make perfect sense if you have more people coming in to, uh, to uh, um, increase the services in, in parallel. That said, we should keep in mind that migrants, as we were saying, international migrants are like, very much like internal migrants. There are not that many of them. So it is not that there is a flood, you know, that we, all, we would be opening the floodgates and we would be taken over by migrants. In any case, if even in settings like the European Union, where the migration barriers are very limited, there are no massive flows anyway. So it's not that you suddenly get like the entire hospital service needing to be multiplied by 10. That's not there. It might be a small increase in demand, which should be matched by an increase in supply. The perception part is absolutely uh, critical. And um, 
I'm not a politician. I, I, I'm not very good at packaging messages. Uh, all I can do as an economist is to put the fact out there, hope that the politician reads it, um, and think about a way to, to package it, to move the conversation away from kind of a non-factual terrain to a factual terrain. To make people happier about To make people understand that they're all less scared about migration. Now, another part of the migration fight is the identity fight, where people feel um, it's not just about jobs, or in particular in the US, uh, the way that uh, the debate has been playing out is not so much in terms of they are taking our jobs, but they are, you know, raping our girls and they are criminals. And, 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 and there are a lot of people who are the most scared of migration are people who have never seen a migrant in their life because they live at the other end of the US and they have never seen a Mexican migrant and they are the ones who are the most scared. That rhetoric is like deeply noxious. Um, it's very, um, I don't have a good answer of how we fight that rhetoric. All I know is that we need to work on it and we really need to put our points together and saying, how do you fight that rhetoric of the immigrant threatening uh, our very existence? So are, are you saying economically there is actually an argument for relaxing our immigration rules, for increasing our immigration in Western developed nations? Yes, economically, we, and relaxing is a good term. We could be quite relaxed about it. It wouldn't create an invasion. Because everyone assumes that if you had, suppose you just have free movement, we'll take anybody. Yeah. The assumption here is that we would be flooded with Africans and Asians. And that's actually not the case. How, when, do, you, we, how do you know? We know because we are not flooded by Greeks. And we were not flooded by Greeks when they were really ultra poor. People prefer to stay home. We know because if you look at India, people stay in the rural area and don't move to the city. I mean, some of them do, but many do not move to the city despite huge difference in lifestyle. So this is again the same thing that we kind of live under the idea that, oh, our life is so much better than, uh, than, than, than theirs, they will want to come. In fact, the people who are the most pro-migration make the argument as well to say, oh, if only we opened the, the borders, people would move and there would be so much pressure here. That's wrong too. It's not, they wouldn't. They, mostly they wouldn't. Okay, let's move on from immigration. The, the other big issue, obviously, that we must talk about because we're in an election period in this country is tax. That is the great argument going on in this country at the moment. You know, do, you know the, the choices are between a party that wants to increase taxes on the wealthier people in, in, in the country and redistribute to some degree, and a party that says it's a low tax party and that that's the way to stimulate economic growth and make everybody better off. What does your evidence tell you? What's the argument you're making here? So on this one, we actually have a lot of evidence that uh, um, you know, lowering taxes has never uh, um, stimulated economic growth, uh, that uh, people are not particularly sensitive to tax incentives, so they don't stop working when taxes are higher, and they don't work more when taxes are lower. That's true for the very rich, and that's true actually for everyone else. So, so the idea that the rich would all leave... Uh, the idea that would they, they would all stop working, stop working, that they would stop working is like preposterous. Or go and live in Switzerland? Uh, so uh, about the living in Switzerland is, uh, is a more delicate issue. In Europe, clearly the, the problem of tax evasion and tax shopping is one that anybody who wants to increase taxes has to reckon with. And uh, there, has, there is no coordination between tax policies in the European countries. Um, and that's... Unfortunate, because it is always people will, you know, will evade. Uh, that is uh, that might happen, but they will not stop working. But is it true that lower taxes put more money in people's pockets? It puts more money in people's pocket, but it's it it doesn't. The fact that they have more money in their pocket doesn't convince them that they should work harder. There was a very interesting episode in Switzerland where they moved from one tax system to another tax system. The technical detail doesn't matter, but when they did that, they, the only way to do that was to give people a two-year tax holiday. So for two years, uh, the, uh, they knew that they were going to pay zero taxes. And that happened in different contents at different times. So you can look at in the contents that has the tax holiday, are people working more? They should, because they know it's only for two years, they should work to the maximum extent possible. 
and you know save the money for later, the effect is zero. There is absolutely zero increase in work effort uh, during the tax holiday or in reported income for that matter. So, the, and that's just one piece of evidence. It happens to be very straightforward and very clear, but it's one of, again, dozens and dozens, dozens of studies that show that if you reduce taxes, people don't work, don't work more. If you increase taxes, they don't work less. But, but what is the impact of tax collecting? You see, one of the examples in this country is that when the government lowered the top rate of tax uh, from 50%, they increased the amount coming into the in, into the exchequer. Uh, so there is a, so th th this is separated in two things. One is the actual real effort, and the other is collection. So my argument was about the actual real effort, which at some level is what we should care about because that's what makes the economy ticks. But also we obviously we also care about evasion and loopholes and. And you couldn't uh, increase taxes without uh, uh, being as systematic as possible to, uh, to fix the loophole. In fact, um, when you compare the effect of uh, tax reforms on tax revenues across countries which have very simple, broad-based tax systems which leaves almost no scope for evasion, you see that in those countries, the, the effect of uh, if you increase taxes, you get more revenue. and that's about it. In uh, countries which have a lot of loophole, that effect is lower because a lot of the money gets moved around, etc. But even that money, eventually, somehow people need to get back. So I, I think it would be necessary on top of thinking about um, uh, increasing the top tax rates. It would obviously ne be necessary to think about fixing you know, the, the tax loophole, uh, regulating the fiscal heavens and some coordination across the countries in Europe. But all of that has, are technical issues, we can solve them. The underlying human behavior that if you tax more, you work less, that's just not true. So the idea that if, if we raised taxes, we would end up you know, stifling growth in some way and there would be less money coming into the government and then as a country we would have less money to spend. That's, that's just not true. That's voodoo economics. That's just so totally debunked that uh, it's not even funny. Uh, Kansas. So why is it such a dominant idea? You know, it's that's just <laughs> politics, is it? Rather than we we uh, we discussed it, we discuss it in the book because uh, uh, when Trump did, did tax reforms, some economists there, there was a huge consensus among economists that it would not stimulate growth in a in in a way that would pay for itself, which is what the Trump administration was arguing. And there, there, there is a pool of top economists who answer questions every month, and they all seem to agree that that's, it would not stimulate growth in this way. So I'm not being revolutionary here. I am like basically representing the consensus of the broad profession. There were still some kind of old-fashioned, old-guard economists who took it, took it upon themselves to sign a letter saying, oh, it might be, there might be an increase in growth. And I, I was, I must say, I was quite amazed by that. I was like, why would you stick your, stick your neck out to say something that's just not true and you're going to be proven wrong in like three years and you're going to look so stupid? And I think there are two reasons for that. And there are also uh, two reasons why um, politicians still get away with making such claims. And Trump got away with making these claims. And uh, now the conservatives are trying to get away with making these claims. And um, the, f the, the main reason is that economists have repeated for so long, you know, since, you know, Milton Friedman and Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher, that it kind of has a bit of a um, tone of a lullaby or mantra. We used to say, that, oh, yes, doesn't that make sense? And the second one is that, again, it goes with our view that uh, um, that is quite widely shared that people are very sensitive to financial incentive. So we did a funny little experiment uh, uh, for this book, which is we interviewed 10,000 people online and uh, more or less representative of the American public. And half of them, we asked them questions about themselves. So suppose that taxes increased. Would you stop working? Would you work less? Would your spouse work less? Would you move? Would you... 
um, do any, would you try to cheat on your taxes? And the other half we ask, uh, if there was an increase in taxes, would other people move, work less, etc.? And about themselves, people said no, they, they wouldn't move, they wouldn't, uh, actually move state is the one thing that they said they would do to some extent, but they wouldn't stop working, their, their spouse would continue to work. Um, but when asked about other people, they think other people would do it. So I think we, we think that other people are sensitive to these tax incentives. So that makes people very reluctant to think about increasing taxes because they are worried that they would kind of be the, the stupid fool <laughs> if they are the one who continue to work and everybody else is slacking. I think we need to be, maybe make people aware that Actually, everybody's like them. <laughs> and so, so you do think that there is such a thing as economic consensus, like scientific consensus around climate change or whatever it is. Because if you take something like Brexit, there are, you know, some key economists um, who are the ones who sort of buck the trend and say, no, you know, Britain could grow its economy and do incredibly well and thrive after, after even a, you know, a very hard Brexit or a no deal Brexit or, or whatever it might be. Um, and... It's a, it's a dilemma for journalists and ordinary people because you kind of have to go, well, how much weight do you have to give them? So I think the consensus really depends on the issue. Uh, on, so th this um, poll of economists that's organized by the University of Chicago Business School is kind of useful to see where people stand, where academic economists stand at any given point in time. And uh, that could be a useful tool to see where the consensus of the profession is. On some issues... Uh, people, uh, there is a lot of consensus. For example, when there was the trade, uh, the, the, uh, President Trump started uh, in, uh, threatening increase in tariff. Uh, a question was posed to economists and there is universal agreement that tariffs would not increase the welfare of the American people, which is completely at, at odd with what most people what the American people, people think, think. Yeah. But, so that's a, so on, but at least there is a consensus on the, on the economists on that. On other issues, there is no consensus. Uh, people disagree. And I think those are often issues where um, the facts are not very well established. For example, on automation, uh, there is much less consensus among economists. Some, some economists think that automation will displace uh, jobs in a way that they are not going to be replaced. And some people think that, oh, it's going to be like the Industrial Revolution. Eventually, it will all fall into place. And I think the reason why there is no consensus in this place is that who, who are we kind of to, to predict the future? It hasn't happened yet. It hasn't so happened yet, and we, we, we don't have all of the elements. So how, how much do you feel you know? I mean, could you design a country now? Could you, could you, you know, if you were given a country, do you feel you would know what to do to make it thrive? No. Uh, I think there is so much that is, uh, uh, so much that is, you know, almost which is out of the control of, of, of the best of policymakers. Maybe if you if you gave me a small city, I could not make it, you know, paradise. But uh, I would have maybe I would have an idea of how to do it. A whole country, I think, in a sense, and that's true for anybody who claimed that they could they, they, that they could for sure fix a country is fooling themselves or fooling the voters. I mean, everybody, politicians. Uh, uh, economists, they have to do the best with what they have, knowing that there is a ton that's not in their control. W what they can do is, you know, pick some issues where they can make progress. We, we, we normally spend quite a lot of this conversation talking about people's lives, and we haven't talked about your life at all. <laughs> we talked about the issues and the subjects. But, I mean, um, just, just, just to briefly look at that, I mean, where did, it, where did your love for economics come from? You know, were you brought up with it, or is it just something you were good at, or...? I had no love for economics whatsoever. In fact, it didn't, you know, growing up would never occur to me that I would become an economist. Uh, I, I, for whatever reason, from the age of eight, I thought I would be a historian, and I studied history as an undergraduate. But also from about that age, I, I, I was very, uh, I was an activist in in my own ways. You know, I was kind of very keen that. Uh, I should do something about about poverty. Uh, I had a lot of exposure to it because my um, my mom and my uncles were both active in active in NGOs that uh, helped with kids uh, victim of wars. So they were traveling to these countries and coming back and talking to us about it. So 
I had kind of always this view of like, what's my responsibility there? Is there, you know, how come I was born in a middle class family in France and some kids have to walk five kilometers to get water? That doesn't seem right. And I had a bit of a crisis of, um, you know, <laughs> vocation, like what am I going to do? So I decided that I was going to take one year off and uh, go to Russia for one year. And um, I got the opportunity there to, to work for economists. Um, and I saw that they could, uh, you know, that their day job was potentially about changing the world. Um, this was just at the beginning of the economic transition in, in Russia. Uh, in 93, 94 is when I spent a year there, and it was a very difficult period for Russia. Just uh, after the collapse of the Soviet just Union. Just after the collapse Russia of the Soviet Sun Union, you know. Russia wasn't feeling his, was trying to feel its way into the new system. You had queues of people, you know, um, impoverished people trying to sell a little bit of something. It was quite a, a crazy times, and I saw economists uh, being, you know, very much in the conversation. I didn't necessarily agree with what they had to say, but I could see that, wow, this is like an amazing job. And I also met at the same time uh, Thomas Piketty, who at the time was um, an assistant professor in economics at MIT. And he said, oh, you, you, you're interested in practical things. Uh, you think economics is too abstract. That's why you've not liked it till then, which was very much true. But uh, if you go to MIT, you will see they will teach you how to really look at data in a very good way, and so you should do that. So the combination of this, in, this you know, the, in finding out about uh, how economics could be pragmatic and how it was taught in the U.S. to be pragmatic and uh, seeing economics in action, that's why I decided, okay, great, this is, this is what I should do because I will be able to carry out my passion, which is improving the lot of the poorest people in the world as part of my day job and not as uh, what I do when I come home. And what, what's it like working with your partner? Uh, I mean, well, when you say when you come home, you come home, you come home with your partner. I mean, you yes. know, so. <laughs> so now it's fine. We are doing it all the time. Uh, it's great. It's, uh, you know, we are both equally uh, passionate about, um, about the work we do. And uh, often when you are in the office, there is so many distractions that you are not actually doing your work, you know, you are doing some other things. And uh, when we come home, even on the way home, we can start actually talk about economics and about our projects. And uh, of course, we also love many other things. Um, Abhijit loves cooking and I like being a sous chef and we have delightful kids and we like to watch cinema. And, but then we also know that we are really passionate and interested in the same thing, and we share values. And, and what difference does winning a Nobel Prize mean, make? I don't know yet. This is a different from any other prize in the sense that it is so public, so it puts you in the spotlight in the way that we've never been before. And on a pedestal. Uh, and on a pedestal, but the spotlight is in a sense what we need to, we can kick out the pedestal and, and, and use the spotlight. We really, we are kind of still discovering uh, what this makes possible, but we really want to use it to further the movement. What we keep saying with both Abhijit and me, but also Michael Kramer, the third uh, winner, is that this prize is not for us. It's really for the movement of thinking really seriously about the issues of development, thinking at them, you know, methodically, little problem by little problem, as scientifically as possible, and using these experimental methods. And that's not something that the three of us did. It's something that the three of us maybe nurtured. You were only the second woman to win this prize. Why is that? There are very few women in economics, so I think that reflects that. And it's not just at the very top, it's everywhere. And there are fewer undergraduate students who choose economics, and of them, they are less likely to become graduate students, and of the graduate students, they are less likely to continue in academia, and so on and so forth. So, so that's why. And that has improved a little bit, so the, the fact that I'm a woman is also related to the fact that I'm young, 
uh, there are more young women. But um, it does not improve nearly as uh, fast as it should. And frankly, the situation is even worse for minority. There are so few minority in economics. And I think this is a real problem because economics being a social science really benefits from diversity of viewpoints. People are different people are interested in different opinion, uh, different questions, and they also uh, see these questions slightly differently. Until recently, um, the profession was not very aware of it being a problem. Maybe because we're economists, we like let the market be. <laughs> Uh, but I think this has changed, and I think there is an effort in thinking about what in our in our culture is a bit um, puts off-putting for women. We have a slightly macho culture in economics, and you know, aggressive, and it doesn't suit everybody, and it's less likely to suit uh, to suit women. Another reason I think why we have few economists, uh, female economists, and minority economists is that. Um, people have this perception that economics is about uh, growth rate and interest rate and finance and all that. Take me, I had no interest in economics, even though I wanted to to, to work on poverty. It, I never put two and two together until I really was directly exposed to the work of economists. So in that sense, the Nobel Prize being given to us as development economists, not just to not just the fact I'm a, that I am a woman, but just the topic, uh, might help showing to young people, look, economics is about these issues as well. And so if you're worried about climate change, economists study that. If you're worried about poverty, economists do that. If you're worried about inequality and mobility and integration and minorities, economists do that as well. We ask everybody, how, how would you change the world if you could just change the world? Can you give an answer to that? I think if I had one answer is that people should start listening to each other and, and, and looking at the fact as fact without coming with too much preconception. Because if we could do that, then we could really collectively solve pretty much all the problems in the world. Esther Duffler, thank you very much indeed.